So today we're just gonna talk a little bit about on-demand listening, because I think that we know that this change is happening, um, but I think sometimes it's good to kind of like take a step back and take a peek at some of the changes that we're seeing happening within newsrooms, but also some of the opportunities that are not just for those newsrooms, but for also other audio newsmakers and people who are aspiring to be audio newsmakers. So the links to these presentations are, um, to this slide presentations are here and I'll make sure I have this code at the end as well. But really, I think when I kind of take a step back and think about what does this all mean, it really means time, right? We are all likely in this room news consumers as well as news makers and so our time is really precious. We don't have that much of it. We are busy, we have a lot of stuff going on. The people we're trying to reach are busy, they have a lot of stuff going on. It's limited, right? But not only is our time limited, everybody is trying to get our time, right? Everybody is vying for those same hours. When we wake up, the first thing we listen to or the first thing we watch or the first thing we read, everybody's trying to be that same thing, right? We see this across industries. Everybody's trying to be, for example, when we started the newsletter craze, everybody was like, we want to be the newsletter that you read on your phone when you wake up, right? We want to be the TV station that catches you up in the morning, right? We all want to do the same thing, which in essence, we all have the right idea, but we're all trying to get that same time. But also, how our audience is spending their time is changing. I think that when we think about COVID and the pandemic especially, that's probably the clearest pushed force, right? We think a lot about how in news we generalize what a person's day is. We say you wake up around this time, then you might you know make breakfast, get the kids ready for school, then you're probably in the car going to work around this time, you probably start work around this time, you probably take lunch around 12 or 1 o'clock, and then you probably head home around 4 or 5 or 6, right? We make these generalizations that we now know are not true for everybody. And now that people are working from home, we have more flexible schedules, there's even more people not in this thing. So how are people um, really spending their time? Um, but first, history, right? Because really when we think about the importance of radio or audio, it really does go back to history. And so in 1920 is when a Detroit station airs the first radio news broadcast, right? Um, and so around this time is where it's like, oh, okay. And I, I think I read somewhere where they're like, yeah, that news broadcast, it wasn't even that important. It wasn't even probably that good, but it happened. And it was like, oh, we can share information on this thing that people have in their houses, right? Um, then we can maybe also do some slight news and entertainment. We can have like a boxing fight. We can have some, some a baseball game, a football game. Let me tell y'all, I'm not a sports person. I don't even know how long these sports were out when they started airing on radio, okay? But I know that this is pretty early for it to be coming out. But then we get this car radio. So not only can you listen to sports and you can start doing all this stuff, but now you can listen to it in the car, right? So again, now we're starting to think about time. What are you doing? You're doing two things at once. You're not just maybe sitting at home with your family around the radio listening to a, your favorite radio drama. You might be driving someplace listening to music. Like you have options now. Um, we have the BBC where now we're trying to get like more and more news coverage. And um, during World War II, Edward R. Moreau reports from rooftops as Germany bombs London. And we're starting to hear like, we hear the sounds of this. We feel kind of everything. It starts to be kind of this first person on the ground reporting situation that now we know, right? Now we know everybody's live from everywhere. But imagine, in 1940, um, scary things happening across the world, and now you're able to actually kind of hear and see um, and visualize, because you can hear and you can kind of 
create this scene in your head of what is happening. So even if you can't visually see, you can kind of create these scenes. Then, you know, we get a boom box, right? And so I know when we get a boom box, people are not like walking around with a boom box listening to news radio, but you know, we're, we're getting portable, right? We're walking around, um, you know, this is the first step to the iPod. We got a boom box. We can take radio wherever we wanna go. We got an antenna, we got all these options. And we get NPR, so now we're able to have like this kind of national look at news. Um, and ESPN is like, oh, okay, we're gonna do sports broadcasts on radio in 1992. Um, and then in 2001, we get that amazing iPod. Now, um, Madeel is going to get mad at me, but I am going to absolutely say that as amazing as we are, when I was a grad student, we were still using iPod Touches to do a lot of stuff, um, and this was 2015. But I hope that we have perhaps retired those iPod Touches. And I tell that story to my audio students now. I'm like, well, you get these nice, beautiful audio recorders. I was doing audio and video and photography on an iPod Touch. And they were like, iPod Touch? What's an iPod? <laughs> so for decades, though, right, so we have this terrestrial radio, and it has really dictated our scheduling. So again, we have these drive times that are prime. We know, OK, when you're in the car, you listen to the radio, what do we want you to know when you're on your way to work? Now, on your lunchtime, we want you to know something different. And then when you're leaving work, what do we want you to know at the end of the day? And I say that because even when I was working in a newsroom not too long ago, we were still very much still talking about these drive times, right? It's still very much an important part of terrestrial radio. Length of content, right? You have these like hour long blocks, hour long shows. You're kind of looking at everything as an hour. Um, types of contents, right? You have a lot of traditional show structures, whether it's a live show or a traditional newscast. Um, you are more likely to fit stuff into a block. Um, I do not recall many news meetings where we would think of new structures. It was very much often, you have a story, your story fits in which of these pre-existing structures, right? Like it is either going to be a spot, which is 45 seconds for where I was at WBZ, a super spot, a minute and 30 seconds, a four minute feature, a eight minute feature, a 12 minute feature. It was all of these specific kind of blocks that you fit in instead of kind of rethinking and saying, okay, but what does the audience maybe need this to be? But when it is radio and it's terrestrial, you can't have dead space. So you do have to have these blocks. That actually is really key to have. Um, so speaking of blocks, right, this is, I mean, this continues to change like every couple years. I want to say that this is the morning edition clock from some years ago, but you can tell how specific every block is, right? Like this is not, you can't change the clock, right? Like you live and you die by the clock. You program everything by the clock. And yes, we still have to do this for terrestrial radio because again, we used to talk about how the radio is like a beast that you have to feed, right? Like, we need spots, we need stories, we need stuff to, 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 to fill up this airspace. You just cannot say, well, actually, I thought this story should only be this amount, or we thought that actually we only want 30 minutes of news today, right? Like, you have to fill up the hour. So, you don't really have an option. You have to have something that's very organized to keep you on track. So yes, so every hour in radio has to kind of still look like this. But from the consumer side, we don't have to wait, right? Like we don't have to wait for our favorite hour to listen to something. Um, and even, you know, our favorite podcast apps, that, don't, that doesn't even take into account all the other types of live streaming. So how maybe your favorite public radio station might also have their own app. Then on top of their own app, you can probably screen, stream their radio programs from the replayer on their website. Then NPR has like NPR One. And there's all these extra additional applications that kind of pull in 
on-demand radio, right? So it, it, even if it is just maybe the exact same radio that you heard or that plays on the radio, which is funny because even though in my car, of course, I can turn to 91.5 and listen to the radio, I am still more likely to stream it from my phone and connect my phone to my car because then if I get out the car, like I reach my destination, I don't have to stop listening to whatever I'm listening to, right? So we have all these choices and they're all personal and it's whatever you actually prefer to do. So like having this radio in your pocket, that does change things, but how? So really, you know, if we're talking about, because a lot of stuff we just don't have data on. So for example, there's no way for us to know exactly how many people are doing what I just said that I did, right? Like instead of listening to my local NPR station, like actually on the radio, pulling it up on my phone, streaming it and connecting to my car. Like there's no way to maybe track all that. So some stuff we can track. And so we know that like about a quarter of US adults get at least some news from podcasts. That doesn't mean they're getting everything. You know, there's people still are listening to radio a whole lot. Radio's not necessarily going anywhere in that sense, right? But we see that especially when we're talking about a younger audience, you know, one in three adults ages 18 to 29, and about three in 10 adults ages 30 to 49, they're all downloading the podcast. They're choosing especially to maybe listen to a podcast instead of terrestrial radio, right? So as a news leader in a radio station, as generations are changing behavior, this is maybe not necessarily something for me to worry about today, but it could be something for me to worry about in 10 years, right? How can I grab these audiences today so that then when they are in the next age bracket, I've kind of built some type of alliance with them, right? Um, one thing that I don't have on this slide is that um, a lot of data also shows that some podcast audience says, and I didn't include it because it doesn't necessarily talk about just news, but for example, NPR's Code Switch. It's not necessarily a news podcast, um, but it covers some issues around race and identity that are often related to news, and that audience is much, much younger, but also much more diverse than the typical NPR listenership. So if you're looking at a podcast like Code Switch, building that NPR loyalty early on can possibly have like long-term effects. But again, that's not necessarily a news podcast, and so I don't really have the data on that. Um, more and more people are downloading NPR podcasts though, period. Like this was specifically about stuff that were kind of like newsy podcasts, like up first and consider this. Um, and basically listenership for NPR programming at member stations. So like I'm in Chicago, my member station is WBEZ, the programs, like the All Things Considered that airs, that is an example of the NPR programming, but that is at a member station. Um, and that declined. So today, right, on-demand listening has changed a lot of these things, right? The things that we were talking about before, the, the things that have been important for decades, they're still important, but it's making people ask some different questions. So scheduling, right? If you can listen any time, what time should your podcast come out, right? Should it be a certain day? Um, should it be that maybe there's something that you would have normally produced on a Friday afternoon that maybe now should come out, you know, you need to produce it Thursday evening and have it produced so that it like publishes Friday morning. Like all of these are kind of new conversations that maybe you wouldn't have had to worry about before. Length of content, right? Again, you know, you're competing for more people's time. So shorter, more frequent things. Like, I'm willing to give a 10 minute podcast, a new podcast, a chance. I'm maybe not willing to give a new hour long podcast thing a chance, right? Like, I start a lot of stuff. I'm not loyal. 
I will turn it off. I turn a lot of stuff off. I'm like, mm-mm, nope, this doesn't work for me. There's too many things in my podcast feed for me to listen to stuff that's not good or well-produced. Um, the mix of content type. I think that this is something that a lot of people are still struggling with. This could very well be a personal opinion. <laughs> but I think that when I look into my news feed as a news consumer and somebody that's trying to study how all of this stuff is coming out, right? This mix of like how much news content is brand new stuff and how much stuff is like repackaged from the radio is just a really hard mix. Because on one hand, if you have all your investment in terrestrial radio, it seems kind of silly to not find a way to repackage the re great reporting you already done, right? It makes a lot of sense to, hey, I got all these amazing investigations and stories and things that we've been working on. How can I pull that out to the podcast listener? But also, a lot of times that doesn't necessarily take into the account that as you're listening on a podcast platform, you're not listening in the same way. You're, you, don't, you don't have the same expectations, right? So, for example, if I'm listening to a live show, I know a live show isn't edited. I know that, you know, they are, the host is talking back and forth with the person, and, you know, it could be rough, and somebody might cut out, and it's live radio. That's what happens. If I'm listening to a podcast version, if you just cut a segment, and throw it on your podcast, which honestly, a lot of people do, and I understand why, right? Like, it makes sense. You're like, hey, I had this great conversation. Why not put it in my podcast feed? But can that really compete with something that is very well produced um, and created just for your ear, you know, like coming off of something that's amazingly produced and going into that, that's a little bit of, of a competitive thing, and I think that that's a mix that a lot of people are still trying to figure out. Um, but what this has led to is a lot of increased competition. So you don't have to be in a traditional newsroom to create this, right? We see a lot of newsmakers popping up and kind of creating their own kind of mini thing, right? When you think even about like a gimlet, a gimlet media where a lot of those people came from NPR and pretty much created what is like NPR light. <laughs> they have all these amazingly produced podcasts that um, are just top tier work. And, but I think a lot of the surprise came from non audio first newsrooms, newspapers, um, digital media places that were like, you know, online who said, oh, but we want to start our own podcast, right? I'm thinking about like Vox. Vox has amazing podcasts. Slate has amazing podcasts. And so a lot of these places early on noticed that, hey, we can do news podcasts, not just any podcast. We can get into the news field and we can become the source of very good news that people will come to every single day. I listen to Vox's Today Explained every day. And I already told y'all that I'm very, very picky. I barely, I, I stopped listening to a lot of people. But I listen to them almost every day because it's so well done, right? And so um, places like that have done it. And I'm going to get back to this idea also of the New York Times and the Daily because I do think that the Daily came around and it's so interesting because they surprised a lot of people. They were able to do what a lot of newsrooms had been talking about, but just had never really made the pure investment um, in order to do it yet. But what does this mean for the future of news radio? So, you know, it really does mean that you do have to identify your audience in a new way, right? You can't just assume that you're going to be in the car. This is going to be for anybody who's driving in the car at 8 a.m. It needs to be a lot more focused. What's the age range? What are the, the interests of your audience? You know, you have to appeal to a more unique and specific group of people. Um, and you have to make something that's really different. That's the only way that you can kind of cut through the noise. Because, again, when you pull up your podcast feed, Everything is going to look the same, you know. What is going to be different about your podcast is going to make somebody 
look at it, right? Somebody like me, and I know I'm an outliner, liar, but somebody like me who I remember when they announced vaccines, I pull up my podcast at that afternoon, almost every podcast that was a news podcast had almost the exact same title of their podcast, something like what you need to know about vaccines or new news about vaccines. And not to say that that's not very important, but how am I supposed to know which one to listen to, right? Um, so is yours a very specific local focus? Are you community-based? Um, are you kind of looking at something in a very wide focus? Are, is your superpower that you're able to add context like no other, right? Like whatever that is, that is something that can make somebody say, well, you know what? I know everybody's talking about vaccines, but I'm going to come to this podcast because I know this podcast will help me walk away and understand this in a way that I don't think I ever could. Um, and then just do it really well, right? You don't have to try to serve everyone, but the people you choose to serve, you just have to do it really well. And I just do want to make it clear that people are still listening to radio. The numbers do show that even if there's like a dip in news radio or news consumption, overall, people are still very much tuned into radio, right? It's still, um, that's not changing. And there's still so many people who don't listen to podcasts, who don't download podcasts, right? That does show a big opportunity, though, um, for people to grow. But it's not like everybody has ditched terrestrial radio and gone into podcasts. But it does show like a really significant shift, and it does show how fast podcasts are growing, um, as well as other like digital online on-demand radio opportunities. So I wanted to go back to the daily because I think that, again, the daily was something that took people by surprise. So everyone in newsrooms, like NPR member stations, for example, used to always say, we got to do a daily, a daily podcast. If anybody could do a daily podcast, it's us, right? But a really good daily podcast means what? You're going to need some money. You're going to need to hire some new staff, right? A lot of people thought, we already got the reported. We're just going to cut the reporting up, throw it in a podcast. People could listen, right? That's the same thing. So you saw a lot of people kind of regurgitating and repackaging stuff that was already reported, um, not really adding to the conversation. And also, if this is going to come out in the morning, how are you going to do a fresh take on news if you're using the old reported stuff from the day before, right? So people were just struggling. I know I was at a newsroom where they still talking about a daily podcast, y'all, from what I hear. And, um, you know, it's just the investment. You got to invest money. So um, the New York Times comes out with the daily and everybody's listening to the daily. And I think that audio people were like, how dare they? How dare they come out with this idea before us? How dare they take off? Because the Daily comes out and they have a clear mission, right? They're doing everything that we kind of just talked about. They say, we're going to do one big story. We're going to do one big story and we're going to do it great. We're going to pull in people. We're going to have analysis. We're going to pull in our reporters and other interviews and all this great stuff, right? We're going to staff it well. We're going to have a huge team, and we're going to do this so that it's able to come out fresh and in the morning and be relevant. And then at the end, we'll just say, hey, here's what else you need to know today, right? So if you've ever heard The Daily, you already know you're going to have, like, Almost most of that 30 minutes is going to be that, and then just some quick headlines. So, you know, again, we, the idea of the water cooler talk, the newsletter to keep you up to date, that's kind of at the end. But at that time, we had NPR's daily podcast was up first, right? So it's supposed to be the biggest three stories of the day. But it was really kind of maybe not as easy to listen to all the time because, right, Up First is trying to do a lot of things. And so not to say that that's not great, but that's not going to be great for everybody. Because if you're a person like me, I don't want to skim three stories because I feel like I don't really know them if I'm just skimming three stories. I need to know at least one of the big stories every day, right? So this idea really took off for a lot of people. People felt knowledgeable. They felt like they could really understand something. So we had up first in 2017, and then in 2020, in the heart of the pandemic, we see NPR have Consider This, right? And Consider This looks very similar 
to our friends at The Daily, um, we have this one big story, right? This was around the time of like talking about vaccines again and all this type of stuff. And then at the end, if you are in a place, like I am in Chicago, and so my member station is a part of this, but if you're in a place where um, your member station is a part of like kind of this pilot, it will play like headlines from the member station at the end. Um, but I know that won't be everywhere, so I'm not sure how many cities they're up to now. But we now we have, you know, we have these two options. And I think this is probably a much better mix because some people will absolutely still love the up first, right? They just want a quick hit. They just want to know what's going on. But then you're going to have people like me who really want to know a little bit more about that one big story. And so even as we talk a lot about change and updating, not everything has to change, right? Like, even if we're talking about new mediums and making stuff really better, there's still like this heart, the heart of radio, right? Like that is what's never gonna change. That's what should not ever change, right? It's like thinking about all of the beautiful things that you think about when you're creating a good podcast. And if you listen to a lot of podcasts like me, the ones that you love still do this, right? So when you're listening, right, you can't control the pace of the story. There is no opportunity to speak, slow down or rewind. So even if you're on demand, you are assuming that people are not using that little 15 second back or forth button, which is really irritating. You can never go back far enough, then you do it, then you're back too far, right? So most people would rather not rewind. So you want to lay out that information in a way that they get it the first time, right? You want your writing to be clear. You want it to be conversational. You want it to feel linear and like it's moving forward with a strong audio structure, right? Um, people can forget names and titles and numbers are confusing and you don't want these long sentences, right? So all of these things are really important. You still want really good tape that have these scenes that can place you in there, right? Thinking back to Moreau and World War II and like using tape and sounds to kind of like, when you close your eyes, you can like envision yourself in these places, right? Whether it's good, bad, whatever that emotion is that's coming out, all of that is still essential to like good audio, right? And so that's it. But, any questions, comments? Um, so, I'm from Chicago too. I love Chicago. Um, WBEZ, honestly, <laughs> the best one there. Um, but there's a lot of these um, multi use. So, there's like Pod Save America, who has their YouTube channel, there's, mm -hmm. I guess, Bannon's War Room. Um, which I think is on TV too. So like, how do you see that playing into the podcast space and you know, changing how, like it gives a visual side of listening as well. Yeah, I think that people are still like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Like, okay, I don't know if this is gonna take off or not. So let me, like, I think people are afraid to make decisions. Um, at least, okay, so like, so for example, right? We know that a lot of the, non-news podcasts do that multi-format, right? And that is because they're usually celebrity-based. Um, people want to see celebrities. People, you know, and they're not really editing it, so it's easy, right? So they just record it, they throw it on YouTube, and they throw it in the podcast feed. And if you're listening, sometimes the audio's bad, they're trying to go out, you know, like they don't, they don't do much work on that. Um, but they're celebrities, right? So. We as audiences, we still listen, they're celebrities. Even if we like kind of, you know, fast forward through some parts or not listen to everything, we're st we still, they still have high listenerships. And so if you are like a newsroom or you're trying to do, you know, some, some more what you think is more serious, important work, you're kind of like, oh, but it worked for them. Right? Like, if everybody's moving to YouTube, what if I don't move to YouTube and everybody's on YouTube and I've missed the mark? Um, and I think that that's what people are, like, afraid of. But I think that what's most important, or what I would say, is that everything that we've seen points to the idea 
that different platforms work for different types of things. So even if somebody really wanted to, let's say, do something for YouTube, I still think overall that YouTube conversation would likely be edited in a different way, right? It's kind of like a TV package versus a print story versus an audio story, right? They're all just different modes and it's a reason why they're different. Um, I've seen some fun stuff or some people try with some fun stuff like at WBZ, the midday show. They are on YouTube now for their Friday re, um, like recap, news recap, but not necessarily just to be on YouTube, but because they can go live on YouTube and invite listeners to kind of sign in, ask questions, leave comment, and the host, Sasha Ann Simons, while she is literally hosting, she'll read comments from YouTube, right? So she's trying to create a more interactive situation. So that, for me, feels a little bit more intentional and creative than, let's say, people who just decide, well, I just, I need to throw something up on YouTube. I must be on YouTube because everybody else is on YouTube, right? Like, thinking through, like, what can this platform help me with or what can it do for me? I could even see maybe if there's a different demographic. Like, sometimes there might be, um, let's say you have a podcast or some type of thing, and it's really about beauty, for example, right? We know that beauty creators are very heavy on YouTube. So I could see why you might say, okay, well, I did this conversation. It was for a podcast platform, but we also know that there are many beauty creators on YouTube. Maybe we should also see how this content would do um, on YouTube. I would still encourage people to figure out if they should edit it a different way, like don't just throw it up there, but I could see how that would be a reason. Um, but I think a lot of people are just scared to be left out. Nobody wants to be, they don't want to be beat, right? Like you don't want to be the NPR that the New York Times had a top selling daily news show before you and you're, you're the, you are NPR, you know, like that doesn't feel good. You don't want anybody to feel like they, you got beat. And I think honestly that that's how some people feel, like they just, you know, but but if you are coming up with something unique and great, even if you're not the first one, you can still make it your own. But I think it's a fear. And then with that fear, you could spread your resources too thin. So maybe then your editing on your podcast is not well resourced because you're trying to do too many things at once. Uh, so you had mentioned that podcasts for news should be pretty short. How, what length would you recommend for podcasts that are maybe not news but relate to news like Code Switch that you mentioned? Yeah, well, you know what? So, okay, so I think that even if a podcast is long, um, one thing that I try to, like, teach to my students a lot is that, like, it should feel segmented and, like, it should be scenes, right? So it's kind of like, let's say you go to a play, and if you go to a play and... Um, you have scenes, right? It feels like it's moving. So even if the play is a bit longer than plays you're normally used to consuming, it doesn't feel that bad. So for example, um, This American Life is always at least an hour, but it's three different acts. And even technically, even though they say it's three different acts, it's really three different stories. Like each one of those could be a different podcast episode, and each within each act, I could say I would generally see like a narrative arc that it might have like what I would say three scenes within each act. Um, and so I think that it's okay to maybe have something longer, but those longer things are really well produced. So um, an hour long, even okay, a third, like one of the three acts of um, This American Life has likely taken six months to produce. Um, so that is different than let's say, you know, we are just starting out. Like I always use this example with my students, like let's just start off with 10 minutes, right? Like let's, we could do a really good 10 minutes because it's hard to do an hour. Um, and so that's why episodes like a lot of Code Switch episodes are like 30 to 40 minutes-ish um, and those also take a lot of months to work on, right? So you usually have people juggling different stories. Um, but I think the ones that 
are a little bit shorter. So for example, I like to use, like it's been a minute on NPR, right? Was well, hosted by Sam Sanders, that's who started it. Now, Brittany Luce has taken over the last couple weeks. It comes out, um, it technically comes out twice a week, but the Friday episode is more of like a talk show, lighter, fun type thing, right? But even within that 30 minutes that comes out every week, the first is usually some type of like intro type interview. Then the second is like, second segment is like a little bit more of an in-depth, kind of more serious thing. And then the last segment is a game. And so even though technically it might be 30 minutes, it's like three different segments of that versus if I just had, if I was interviewing somebody for 30 minutes and you had to listen to just me, because you don't want to listen to me for 30 minutes, right? Just me talking to somebody or just me talking for 30 minutes. So I think it, it, it matters, but like you can have like stuff that's segmented and feel like it's moving and do something longer. One of the points that you made really resonated with me, which was to compete in the podcast space, you need to have a high production value or better mm -hmm. production quality. Um, given that like news has a shorter shelf life and like a shorter window mm -hmm, of relevance mm -hmm. than like an investigative or an yeah. enterprise piece or even an entertainment piece, do you think it makes business sense for smaller publishers, like smaller than mm -hmm. New York Times or NPR, to do high production quality news on podcasts? That's a great question. I think that, so, okay, so one thing that we, so I know I say high quality, but I think that when I mean high quality, I still mean like um, the opposite of maybe just like recording and then just like kind of throwing stuff up, because we see that too. Um, but we have what we will say like kind of light touch and then like very heavy. So like when we're talking about like the This American Lives and stuff like that, like that's six months in the making. But like something like the It's Been a Minute, those conversations can be edited down in a day. So I think that it probably would make sense for like a smaller publisher to do something that feels much more attainable, something that is maybe like weekly, something where you don't have to worry about if you schedule, like let's say if you schedule somebody to talk on Wednesday of the next week that it won't be old news by then, you know? So maybe you might not wanna do super fast, quick topical news, but you can do broader ideas, right? So even if we're talking about something that's developing really quickly like Ukraine, you know, maybe it is a look back at the history of something. I had a student that did a really good story about like Ukrainian language. So I'm thinking about like stuff like that where it's like it's related to the news for sure, but um, it would give you the time to finesse it and work on it and you could have like a whole week to do it before you have to like produce something else. But I think something like that, I've seen smaller publishers do really great. So a lot of my friends who even work at places like WBZ, like I have a friend who has a podcast there and it's just her and one producer. Um, and they have a weekly show, and then sometimes they have like a, another, like a book club that comes in, like on some, you know, that kind of has shows that come in between that. But um, even with just a very tiny team, they're able to really pump it out because they can kind of keep the focus on stuff that's topical-ish, but not too newsy. And that might be with, you know, I think one thing that I actually love is when some podcasts are just really good at context, because I'm a person where I'm like, oh, I just really am confused about this. I don't really know what this means, right? So if you can explain something to me, I can read a newspaper for, you know, the, the headlines for updates on what happened in something, but if you can give me that background or that context, that usually has a longer shelf life, and it also helps you push it. Um, and then you can also bring it back up. So something else happens, like let's say you did something on some history thing with Ukraine and Russia, and then a new development happens, you can push it out again and say, hey, this thing happens. You also can even just, if you want to push it back out in the feed, not just on socials, add a new top and say, hey, we did this last year, hey, but we think it's relevant because it's just happened. Enjoy this episode that we did last year and push it back out to your feeds. Um, I mainly wanted to say that uh, I followed Noelle King over to Today Explained and I love it. 
It's so good. Yes, um, it's so good. For young journalists, though, that are interested in audio journalism, I guess, or telling stories through audio, uh, you know, some of the, if you're really excited about it and you're still a student, you know, you might try to get like an internship at NPR or a station, but those are pretty cutthroat and are very hard to get. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that a lot of journalists end up in newsrooms that might be rural or understaffed or just, you know, in smaller communities. And so if you're in that type of situation, which is probably more realistic than yeah. getting the dream NPR internship, yeah. what would you recommend to young people um, in terms of like, if you're excited about audio, mm -hmm. but you're at a small newspaper that isn't looking at that space at all because they're just trying to stay alive, uh, what would you suggest a young person does to approach leadership or their editor to try to start exploring in the audio space? Yeah, yeah. I think especially if, if like, let's say you're out reporting anyways, right? Get some tape, put something together and play it for your editor, you know? Um, because I think that is one of the things is that people in leadership are interested in things that don't cause them extra money at first, you know? Um, and so in those situations, especially if you have the time to, let's say, produce something, you literally have to go and interview those people already. It's already likely that you're gonna re be recording them like on your phone to get accurate quotes. Just record them on better equipment that you have. Record them, take it back, maybe produce something as like a pilot or like a proof of concept to say, look, this is what we could do. And we could do something like this relatively easy. I could produce it every week. Um, you know, this is what I would need to make it happen. Um, because really that would be helpful. And then I guess one other thing that's kind of related to that, that I always tell students is that, you know, when we were talking about that clock, like this beast has to be fed. And a lot of times I have students who, um, you see people try to get like those dream podcast internships and they're just really hard to get. Um, but if you can get into a newsroom, everybody wants to know if somebody can help feed this beast. So you are more likely, if you got some spots, some, some short, you know, you can show, you can go out and get tape, you can do this type of stuff and you can help with this, then you're more likely to get into a newsroom like WBEZ as a news intern and just really pump out some good work. Get in, And you'll be in the right rooms with the right people and be able to kind of grow. But I remember when I started at BZ, I started as a temp and I didn't know who was an intern and who wasn't because all I saw was the byline. So it's not like you sign off like I'm Ariane Nettles, intern or temp, right? Like you, you, you don't do that. So I always tell people, don't go for the fancy all the time. Like people need you, they really need you. And like a big newsroom, like even BZ, you have people working on big investigative projects that pull them away from the daily grind of the newsroom and so that leaves all this opening so it's like if you have this person doing this investigation in downstate Illinois and you have these people interviewing the mayor and you have these like who's left to fill the newscast we got to feed the beast we can't have any dead air and so if you're an intern and you can come and you can help with what you might think is small, that is what's gonna help. Like, versus people who come and like, you know, in an interview, they're, you're like, hey, so what do you think about our news coverage? And all they can do is talk about the podcast. It's like, uh, you don't really listen to us, you know? But if you can come and you say, well, I like this and this and this, like those are the people who get the internships and they come and they get clips and clips and clips and every news intern that leaves BEZ, they generally go off and get amazing roles, like every everyone. Um, and so that's how I often add that to the mix too, is that it might be that you might get an internship like that where you're helping feed this beast. Um, and it's just one hour. It's like, you got like a lot of hours in a day. <laughs> I just want to add something. I'm at Nebraska Public Media. So we have you know, yay! <laughs> we have internships and we have job openings for entry level positions. We need people to feed this beast. We need people to create podcasts. So WBEZ is one opportunity, but if you're a Nebraskan or you want to work in a smaller shop, but one that's uh, punching above its weight all the time, come to Nebraska, public media. <laughs>
Yes, yes, and I have students. I will, I will send them your way. That's exciting to know. Thank you for this presentation. I thought it was amazing. And uh, you know, my question is kind of a follow-up on smaller newsrooms. So discoverability is atrocious on these uh, podcast platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, they're highly curated, and me as a consumer, I'm having a hard time finding uh, diverse voices, uh, smaller communities, yeah. things around my neighborhood. Uh, it's one of those things where I feel as if I'm, I'm sick and tired of seeing true crime podcasts. But mm -hmm. what I'm getting at, though, and my question for you is, do you have any recommendations for uh, smaller newsrooms uh, to be able to penetrate and reach their communities? And likewise, for me as a consumer, do you have any yeah. recommendations on how I can discover uh, smaller, you know, uh, diverse voices as well? Yeah, yeah. So one way that I, lo I love those questions um, and thank you, because I'm I thinking the same way. I'm always, like, I live, like, on the south side of Chicago. I'm always, like, I love news, but I want to hear about my side of town, too. I want to make sure that we're included. I want to hear about more communities than just, like, the downtown parts of Chicago. And so... Um, as so for smaller newsrooms, I've seen people who are like kind of launching new things do stuff like embed those podcasts in their stories that are related. Um, so we have, and I'm not sure how it's doing because it just started, but like we have a small, um, a small list. They're actually growing pretty fast, but um, Black Club Chicago is like a local community based newsroom in Chicago where they literally do like you are the reporter for this community. You are the reporter for this neighborhood, like that. And um, they launched a podcast, which actually ended up being a television show now, which they connected with like a local. So I think they've just invested more maybe now in the TV part. But when they first um, launched, I thought it was really smart that they embedded that into the stories that were related. So if they interviewed somebody and... Um, then had the reporter on the podcast to talk about that story, they made sure that they embedded it in there. Because I think really utilizing your current audience is a way to grow it. Because essentially, especially if you're like smaller and really focused, you can truly expand in that space. But like, you're not going to be like super discoverable, but that's kind of okay because that's not, those aren't your people, right? Like you want to be close to your people, right? More events, more like ways just to make sure that people can like click on it from where they already are. So if, if you do have like, wherever on your website you have the most traffic, for example, pushing them from there. Um, if you have, let's say, friends at another local place that has really good traffic and y'all have similar audiences doing episode shares, we'll share your episode, you'll do ours, interview us on there, you know, so a lot of collaboration often happens, I think, especially at that level, which is amazing. Um, and then as a news consumer, I try to approach it the same way. I usually hear about local stuff because the people I follow are local reporters. And so I follow those local reporters where they go and then they might be on that. So like we have, so CityCast um, is, I'm, it's opening up at a lot of cities. Chicago was one of the first cities to get a city cast um, pilot and like a city cast um, podcast. But now they're like expanding to different cities. Like I know they're in Denver and I saw they're going to like, I think I just saw Milwaukee. So they're Seattle. So they're in different places. And so when I, when they started, I saw friends go and either they were being interviewed on City Cash Chicago. Now I go on City Cash Chicago a lot. And so that's just an example of a very like localized podcast where it's only about Chicago. So if you're not about Chicago, like this is not the podcast for you. I don't even know if it's necessarily discoverable, but like I necessarily have connected from Twitter, from embeds, from me seeing people I know who are on it. So especially if you can get like people who are influential in your community, who kind of have that online presence, who can say, hey, I was on this new podcast, please support it, um, and kind of get that community backing, because especially, I'm sure your community would be like, oh, we need this, we want it, um, and would support it that way too, so 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.